Bible tonight, would you turn with me uh, to uh, the book of Acts chapter 2. <laughs> Acts chapter 2. All right, praise the Lord. Uh, my brother Mike said, praise the Lord for hungry hearts, for the word of God, I promise you this, if God has anything to do with it, he'll feed us, amen? amen. amen. God will take care of us and bless us, praise the Lord. It is so good to be here with you tonight, and we thank God for the opportunity. I always take so much for granted, church. I always take so much for granted. My health, my family, my church, my life, my job, my house, my car, everything that God's given me. It's all he is anyhow. It's just on borrowed time. I was born with nothing. I'm going to die with nothing. And I uh, can't take anything with us. So we, if God would help us during our time here not to get caught up and put those things ahead of him, uh, which I've certainly been guilty of and, and continue to be guilty of even myself. May God help us all uh, to do a better job with that. But I'm so glad for the word of God uh, that we have it here tonight uh, and that we get to look at the word of God and just really come in tonight and just thank God for a, a nice facility uh, that's climate controlled and the freedom tonight to open up the word of life and be able to look at it. May God help us here tonight. Uh, we're going to continue on our efforts tonight of following up the fellowship from Sunday night. And uh, it's going to be a little different take, so don't nobody leave. Amen. Praise the Lord. And uh, so we're going to look at it tonight. We're going to do a continuation. Now, Look at Acts chapter 2. Look at verse, we'll be looking at verses 37 through 47. And um, let's look together. Um, I'm going to find it myself uh, real quick. I did not mark it. Acts chapter 2. But what is so awesome here is the early church. If we could ever change our name, and I certainly don't want to do this so nobody don't hear me wrong tonight and misquote me. But if, Lebanon, if, I, if you said, well, Mike, if you could change Lebanon to Greenville Baptist Church to another name, what would it be? I think early church Free World Baptist would be a great name, amen? Then we would pattern ourselves just by the early church and what God was doing because it was certainly fresh uh, to everyone. But let's look at Acts 2 and verse uh, 37. All right. Now, when they heard this, now let me clear that up. Peter's preaching. And Peter's been preaching here. He's been preaching the gospel. We're going to look at verse 38, what the doctrine of his message is. But Peter's actually preaching to a multitude of people. They were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are after um, afar off, rather, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, which means, of course, to urge, uh, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward uh, generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto to them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. And in breaking of bread and in prayers and fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men. As every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now this is a familiar passage for us because this word is a word that we have um, reiterated from time to time here at Lebanon because of the growth and because of what God has done here. But I want to go back once more tonight uh, to this passage of Scripture. Now I want you to think about something for a minute. How many souls tonight, um, how many souls in this word have, does the Bible indicate have been saved or added to the church in one day? 3,000 souls. Now let me tell you something. I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ Knowing God, God already knew before the foundation of the world what was going to happen because he's omniscient. 
He knows everything. God knows exactly, even though we believe as free will Baptists, God, he died for everyone. We, we don't believe that there's just some people who can go to heaven no matter what. But we believe that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So he did that so that whosoever would believe. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are, um, you know, what you've done. We've talked about that before. But we believe that all man can be saved. Now, we do believe and teach and preach in total depravity. We believe depravity of being depraved means that there's nothing you and I can do to get to heaven uh, no matter what our works are, no matter how good we do for God, and even in his church, and no matter how, uh, like the good old boy mentality you got, you know probably know people right now, you invite them, they are good people, but they're going to die and go to hell. I don't care how good they are if they've never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, if they've never received the gift of salvation, they will die lost. No matter what. So that means total depravity or being depraved means there's nothing that any mortal man can do to get into heaven. There's nothing that man could do to overcome his sin and pay the debt of sin. Only the Lord Jesus Christ is the acceptable sacrifice that God will accept you only on the behalf of Christ. So if you're going to get into heaven, you've got to have the Lord Jesus Christ and listen, listen, I mean, go as far as saying, if a man, say a man give $3 trillion to a church, he still will not go to hell if you don't have Jesus. Amen. If you've been, if you had that drug problem that we talk about growing up where you were drugged to church everywhere and you've been in church, you've never got perfect attendance when you die, you're going to die and go to hell if you've never accepted Jesus. Amen. It doesn't matter. What that means is when you hear the word total depravity or being depraved, it means that you and I can do nothing good enough to overcome and pay the debt of sin in our lives and go to heaven. Jesus Christ paid that ransom. He and he alone. Well, what happened here, though, I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ knew when he went to the cross exactly who would accept him when the last person gets saved. When that acceptable day is done, whenever that day is, because we live in a time, church, we must understand we live in a time right now that this is the era for the church. See, churches should be rising up. Churches should be going out, evangelizing. I mean, this is the evangelical church right here where we evangelize the gospel and we sow the word. We sow the good news. You know, the good news about the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and we should be excited about that. And we should be telling the world about it. And we should be telling that the grocery stores and the checkout line. And, and God, if you ask God tonight, say, God, give me an opportunity to tell somebody about you and tell the good news. God will give it to you. Amen. So just be ready to let, because remember, you're not by yourself. At the very moment you were saved, you were indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You are now uh, the Holy Temple where God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. So it's not just you at the cash register. It's just not you at the neighbor's house. It's not just you in the car line picking the kids up. It's God in you trying to live through you. Sometimes what we need to do is get out of the way and let God just motor right through us and just reach the world and be the life and the body of Christ. And listen, the less of us, the more of him. That's just the way it is as Christians. We just need to get out of the way and submit and be submissive. But I believe that Jesus Christ knew exactly on that day over 2,000 years ago when he died exactly whom would be in the Lamb's book of life. And he knew even in the scriptures before he died, he said that there would be few, okay? He said there would be the, the, the road to heaven is narrow. And then at the gate, there will be few there who find it, he said. So he said, he's illustrating, telling us on a percentage that a lot more people are going to reject him, go to hell, and there's only going to be a few people who's going to accept him and go to heaven. So he knew that even though he died for the entire world, he died knowing that the majority of the world he was going to die for, that his father loved so much, he knew when he died that gruesome death that majority of the people were not going to accept him. 
And think about this for a minute. And then even knowing this, the ones who accepted and there was no guarantee they were ever going to do a whole lot for him before they died. You know, it might have been a little bit different if he would have got there and said, well, 14 billion people will go to heaven. And out of that 14 billion, they will be the most, the, the most excellent display of Christian soldiers you've ever seen. No, a lot of people get saved a lot of times just before they die. They spent their, their, their measly years here on life, 70, 80, 90 years, what it is. And the majority of the lives who I believe go to heaven did not spend the majority of their lives on earth living and serving him. In fact, most of their lives, even as Christians today, have been useless to the work of God because the biggest regret that you find in older people, if they ever get saved, which statistically is difficult the older you get to get saved, so please understand that and stop waiting around or encourage somebody who's never been saved. But even then, even then, we've not sacrificed a whole lot for God because basically we lived our entire lives the way we wanted to and fed the flesh and did not allow the Spirit of God to lead us and develop us and make us great Christian men and women, boys and girls for God. He, knowing that, he still went to the cross. He still died because Amen. God loved us in spite of ourselves. Yes, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And you can even go on to that, but I won't add to the word nor take away from the word. But he, Paul could have went on to say, but even after he died and committed his love toward us, knowing that the majority of the world who is in their sin will remain in their sin and die captive to sin when they could have accepted the gift of salvation and went to heaven, Jesus Christ still died on the cross knowing that the same people who spit in his face and pulled his beard and beat him and scorched him, mocked him, would continue to do that throughout all of the days of man. Because if we don't do it face to face, we certainly do it because when we tell God we're going to live in the flesh and in our sin, it's an insult and it's a disgrace to his grace. And so what happens is it's a direct hit. But I say this, that all that being said, God's son would have died on the cross if it were not been for but one Amen. soul. Amen. Because God loves yes, he us. So that being said, 3,000 souls? Now, let me give you a comparison for a moment. In one day, 3,000 people got saved. Woo, that is a preacher's dream. Amen. <laughs> Anybody? I mean, that, how, how did Peter feel when he got? Woo, yeah, praise the Lord. God is good. But now, how many times have we complained about 300? Did you realize that the majority of our church growth has been through salvation? Do you realize that? That is God's method for church growth. His souls to be saved, to be washed, and baptized, to make disciples of them. That is God's method of church growth. So now what happens is God's grown it. Now, could you imagine how it was to remember 3,000 people's names? <laughs> Indications were they were somewhat like Lebanon was before the growth. I think, going back, I didn't research it before tonight, but I think it was somewhere in the excess of 120 or so people uh, actually accounted for going into this day. So that was, that was Lebanon, you know, and 100 or so people. What if, boom, not just in five years has there been 300 people added to the flock in Lebanon, but 3,000 people were added in one day. Man, but let me ask you this. Now, these people just got saved. Do you believe that there was a lot of immaturity in 3,000 people? Do you think that they go in house to house and visit these people? Do you think they said some stupid stuff? <laughs> Be honest. You know what I mean? Some stuff that we would take them out the street and stole them for, you know? But, but there was a lot to contend here. Let me ask you this. Where did they put them at? All they had was the upper room. And there's no indication that that was a large room because a lot of the time it was just in secret, almost like a second level or a law. The upper room, Free Will Baptist Church, is where Jesus started it all around the table. Amen. They couldn't put them all in one house. In comparison, 
But in comparison to them, we're not in such good shape when only 300 people then transformed in five years versus 3,000 in one day. See, worrying doesn't change anything but you. It adds your wrinkles, your gray, maybe turns it loose. Worrying will never, ever change anything but you. It's the only thing that's ever going to change. So let us not worry about the details because our God is not just only a good God, he's a detailed God. And he knows what he's doing. But that being said, let me share with you now some things that happened in verse 42 about their fellowship. I love this. Look at verse 42. Number one, may I submit to you, they continued in their fellowship. Look at verse 42 again with me. And they continued steadfastly. How did they continue, church? Steadfastly. steadfastly. Well, what does steadfastly mean? Let me give you a few different definitions. Number one, fixed in a direction. Fixed in a direction. Let me give you an example. If you go down County on Road in a little while to drop off cakes, cards, and gifts for a birthday tomorrow, this is what you're going to see on the left-hand side before you get there. Exactly a mile point, one eight on the right. Anyhow, on the left before you get there, you're going to see a several hundred feet long irrigation system. And this irrigation system in that 100 acre or so field, what it does is it pivots about 180 degrees from its, from its uh, axis or from its point where the well actually is. And what happens is, you've seen a lot of it, what it does is it just takes, I don't know how many hours it takes for it to actually get there, but it is a long process for this several hundred long feet irrigation system to make a swipe across that field, do its job and do it well, and get to the other side. But let me tell you what that irrigation system is. It is an example of what you and I should be in God's church. See, we can't get to heaven sooner enough, some of us. You know, I don't believe in that Kenny Chesky song, I want to go to heaven, I want to go right now. I want to go! You know, so here's the thing. But, but the thing is, this thing is steadfast. See, it's fixed in its direction. It knows where to go because it's led by higher power, by electronics. And it has a station. And not only that, it has direction because it's being powered by something greater than itself and more knowledgeable than itself. But not only that, it is being fueled and being indwelt by the very well of water that lies beneath it, filling it up. And it's dispersing as long as, as, as while it goes, it's doing its job, irrigating the field and taking care of it. Well, see, we're filled with the Holy Spirit of God. The, the, we should be filled, we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. Let me ask you a question. Where's your fruit? Where's your, where's your, what kind of fruit have you produced lately? See, what happens is God is productive. Can I get a witness? God is productive. God's going to produce. He's never failed, and neither will he ever fail. Amen. God will produce. Therefore, if we are God's people who are called by his name, then we are a product of God, been created and saved by God. Therefore, we also are called to produce. What have you done for God lately? Are you bearing any fruit? So what happens is, what, how would this irrigation system be if it went from all of what, what if this system just done this? What if it took two days for this field and this irrigation system made it swipe all the way around that field but didn't put out any water along the way? Did it do any good? Is it somewhat useless? Is it a waste of time? Should it even be there? By God, if we're going to do it, we need to produce it. We need to do our job well. God, if you want me and you want to use me, you don't have to ask him to turn the well on. He just needs for you to get out of the way and let him disperse what it is he wants to do on this earth before the accepted day is up. Because one day this error will pass. 
The day of grace, there will be an unaccepted day where there is no more grace and mercy extended unto man to be saved. So what we do, we're like that. But what happens is they continued in their fellowship. Look what it says. They continued in their doctrine. What's their doctrine? Look back at verse 38 again. Let's reiterate that for a moment. Then Peter said unto them, he's preaching to everybody, repent, there's doctrine, be ye baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, there's doctrine, for the remissions of sin, that's doctrine, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That there is doctrine, that is the gospel truth, and when they came together, they continued in this doctrine. May God help us when we continue in fellowship. To make sure we have the right doctrine. Amen. See what happens so often is we all come from diverse backgrounds. See these people come from different parts. Everybody wasn't just raised up in the little town of Jerusalem. See these people come from all over the park. See some of you have been raised by maybe your parents, your grandparents, a, a guardian, uh, someone else. And what happens is we all have different points of views. But when we come together in Christian fellowship unequally though, this does not mean people use that for interracial relationships. That is incorrect. That is not true. That is not what Paul is implying. When he said unequally yoked, he meant for Christian to be with Christian and sinner to be with sinner even. See, if you come to me and you want me to marry you, I'll marry two sinners before I'll marry a sinner and a Christian. Because you're unequally yoked. And God told us not even fellowship being unequally yoked. Well, how do you think I'm going to marry you if you're unequally yoked? I can't union you. You are unequally yoked. <coughs> Paul is talking about not to be unequally yoked. It means you either got to be this way or that way. But we come together. When we come together in Christian fellowship, we can share our ideas and our views, but we should have one common ground. The doctrine of the Word of God says, listen, that all men should repent and that we should accept the Lord Jesus Christ. We should get baptized, be filled with the Holy Ghost, and we are to serve God till the trumpet sounds or our hearts stop sticking. We can agree on that doctrine. And, and listen, I love Peter. He laid it out there real plain where it wasn't complicated. He said, continue in that doctrine as you fellowship as well. But look what he said. They continued in fellowship. They didn't just stop. You know what happens sometimes? People come in here and there's an excitement. Woo! We got somebody to come to church. Oh, I pray the Lord. It's an act of Congress. We got them in here. But then when they get here, it just dies off. It's like the excitement just falls off. Or, or maybe if somebody just got saved. Woo! Praise the Lord. We've been praying for that one right there. That one got saved. But we shouldn't just quit our fellowship with them. Some of the same attempts we took to get them here initially are some of the things we're going to have to continue to do after we get them here or we may lose them. Norbert Gibson told me in my marriage counseling was something that I have failed miserably. He said, Mac and Leslie, he said, uh, you want to get married? I said, mm -hmm. He said, okay, tell me something it is y'all do that you love. Well, we love to go out and get something to eat and go to a movie. Okay. He said, how do you do that? I said, every time we get together. <laughs> he said, well, put it this way. He said, that is something y'all love to do together right now as a couple, right? Looking to get married. I said, yes, sir. He said, never stop courting your wife then. He said, because if it is something that kept you together during your years of dating, it's something that will continue to keep you together after you're married. And what happens? We get married, we have a job, we got lots on one another, we, you know, we let everything start hanging out, we don't care! <laughs> She's mine now, he's mine now, yeah, you should care, amen? You know, they didn't buffet the body, it's buffet the body, amen? Praise the Lord! And we should care. And, and but that's what happens is, you know, he said, continue. All right, okay, all right, that, that's applicable here. The thing that got some of these people here, if we stop after they get here, then we're hypocrites. Remember I told you the other week how you see somebody and you do this when they're coming? And right time they go, you don't care about them. You're not happy to see them. You're just glad they don't buy 
So you can go back and do it one of these. You were doing it before they got close to you. That's why I told you at least do this for like three more seats. You mean let it be a slow thing? You know what I mean? But I see people all the time. Hey, there's so and so. And I'm like, hey, look at that people. You know what I mean? So my thing is, we can't just just get them in here. When we get them here, we got to continue in that doctrine and that fellowship and in breaking that bread and in the prayers. So the very thing that maybe got them here will keep them here. We continue in the fellowship. And that's what they did. The very thing that got these people saved that day, they didn't stop. They continued on. They didn't just say, well, there's another one, another little feather in my cap. Or there's, a, there's another little strike up for Mac. No, it wasn't about that. It was sincere. It was from the heart. It was out of love and not out of ego. But not only that, I love here uh, a steadfast, face in a direction, unwavering, firm in purpose. All right, look at the second one in verse 24. They congregate. Look what happens in their fellowship. Look at verse 44. And all who believe were together. You see that? They're not, they're not, they're equally yoked. They're not unequally yoked, but they are equally yoked because it says all those who believe were we're together. And why is that? Well, there was great animosity during this time right now in the early church because you've got Christianity now coming onto the scene versus Judaism. So now you've got Judaism that which believes in, you know, taking the law and the law of Moses, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible are the Pentateuch. So now you've got the law of Moses, or the law of God. And Judaism is just practicing and preaching and teaching the law, and that's what they're supposed to do. But Jesus Christ comes on now, and he says, this is a New Testament. In this blood is there a New Testament. And he comes in the name of grace. And now there's controversy because now there's a different religion on the scene. And it's not really God. Jesus Christ didn't come to, to break the law. He came to fulfill the law. So that's what he's trying to do in part. So now he comes and he's fulfilling everything. And there's this controversy. There's great animosity between the Jews and now the Christians, even though these Jews are Christians. But, but so they're just being saved. And so now they're having to resort. Now let me tell you something. That's a rough world out there. Them people don't care about you. They don't have the love of God in them. If they're carnal and they're of the world, they don't have God in them. And listen, if we say we've got God in us and we've got the world in us and we hate our brother, Jesus Christ says you're a liar. You deceive your own self. Listen. Now it's not so much about Judaism and about the Jews versus these Jews who accepted Christ and Christianity, but it's about the lost and the saved. It's about carnal things and of the world and of godly things and of Christ and living a life for Him, unwavering, being steadfast in the doctrine, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, in the prayers. We continue, but we congregate because what happens is the world should push us together. We should come to this church and know or go to one another's houses or in this and say, this is a haven for me. There's a lot of animosity out there. And those people don't believe in what I believe in. But when I come together with my family, there's a synergy. There's an energy that is unlike anything else. And I know together we can stand and we can stand strong and we can stand a good kind of proud because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It was the same way. They congregated. They, they banded together. They, they, they assembled together. But how did, what did they do when they assembled? Look on it now. Look what happens here in verse 44 in your Bible. And all who believed were together, look what it says, and had all things common. All things were common. You know what it happened? A lot of the persecution is going down right because of the Christianity. A lot of people are losing their jobs. A lot of people are losing their jobs and they're losing a lot of their credibility in the community now because they're not like them anymore. But now they've accepted this Jesus Christ who is blasphemous. We crucified him because he was wrong. He was, he was a false prophet. We killed him because of what he said and what he did. And you take an allegiance to this Jesus Christ. You're fine. You're no longer welcome here. And all of this is going on. But you know what they could do? They could come together in one accord. They could come together with all brown common. Let me read something to you. One night in a 
church service, a young woman felt a tug of God in her heart. She responded to God's call and accepted Jesus and her Lord and her Savior. The young woman had a very rough past involving alcohol, drugs, and prostitution. But the change in her was evident. As time went on, she became a faithful member of the church. She eventually became involved in the ministry teaching young children. It was not very long until this faithful young woman had caught the eye of the heart of the pastor's son. The relation grew and they began to make wedding plans. This is when the problems began. You see, about one half of the church did not think that a woman with a past such as hers was suitable for a pastor's son. The church began to argue and fight about this matter, so they decided to have a meeting. As the people made their arguments and the tension increased, the meeting was getting completely out of hand. The young woman became very upset about all the things being brought up about her past. And she began to cry, and the pastor's son stood up to speak, and he could not bear the pain it was causing his wife to be. He began to speak, and his statement was this, My fiancé's past is not what is on trial here. What you are, what you are questioning is the ability of the blood of Jesus to wash away sin. Today you have put the blood of Jesus on trial, so does it wash away sin or not? The whole church began to weep as they realized that they had been slandering the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Too often, as Christians, we bring up the past and we use it as a weapon against our brothers and sisters. Forgiveness is a very foundational part of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is common when we come together. And we sometimes are way too judgmental. We judge a book by its cover when we should not even judge it at all. That's God's job. But we should come together in one accord as believers being equally yoked and saying this. There may be animosity in the world, but the fight is out there, not in here. We come together, and when God sees us, he sees the blood that washed away the crimson stain of sin, and God blesses his people when we come together with that in mind. It's not about him. It's not about her. It's not about what she did. There's nobody who's right. There's nobody who's wrong. How can we fix it and move on? Souls need to be saved and stop wasting time on this nonsense, and God will bless his people and grow his church daily. Amen. And that's good stuff. Amen. Praise the Lord. I've seen it even myself. People cannot outlive their sin. And thank you, God, for this eye-opening experience because I have seen too many people put the blood of Jesus Christ on trial and not the very person who has overcome their sin. We are now the same in the eyes of God. Maybe that's why some of the worst sinners have become the best Christians I have ever seen. But that being said, beneath all the rubble in the paper, they not only come together commonly, but they came together compassionately. <coughs> Man, she's so. When you come to this place, I want to know how you think. I want to know what's bouncing around in that beautiful little head of yours. You just walk up in here. Because it's Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. You come in here just because this place is closer to your house than any other church. You come in here because you fear God and you think you're going to die and you'll take your breath away if you don't come. You know, I love the Lord. And I'm questioned by many. And I don't like it. But I understand that God has instituted his church. I believe more for the body of the believers than he did even for himself. What good is the church if we're not united? What good are we? We are useless. And you know why I'm so tired and sick of being tired of dead churches? I've asked God to do me a flavor. Don't ever, ever put me in a church that dead, unless they willing to wake up. Because I know who has the resurrected power. 
He can resurrect. That's what bothers me the most. They dead and don't have to be that way. That's what bothers me so bad. <laughs> but boy, what we could accomplish. But when you come in here, you know what? It isn't just a pastor's heart. It's God's heart in us. Amen. I love Brother Reed. Does, does Brother Reed maybe say or do something that, that maybe I wouldn't like? Yeah. Maybe I'll do something that Brother Reed. Yeah, I probably don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take this to God in you know. <laughs> but you know what? I love that man. Amen. Brother, I love you, bro. I love you with all my heart. You are dear to me. But then I can look right back and I can look at Brother Reese. And I've not known Brother Reese near as long as I've known Brother Reese. But Brother Reese, I love you, bro. You're dear to my heart. You know what? I know God is alive. Well, brother, see you. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. And he knows there's a God like it. He loves me too. But, but I love people. You know what I mean? Because you know, I believe if, if you were worth the blood and the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, you ought to become of some importance to me. If I am who I say I am. But I just love coming to God's house. Now, it's a parent to look around and not see that some people don't. <laughs> In fact, most of them. But here, here's what I want you to take home tonight from this fellowship. Ready? Why do we allow the world who has no power over him? What did he say? Did he say, uh, oh, how does it go? Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Has he not already overcome death, hell, and the grave? But yet I allow it to damper me as a believer and influence me and dim my life and try to take away the joy that God has given to me. When he is already, he says, I'm more than a conqueror. If he overcame it, we've overcame it. The fact is we just not realize that yet. But I should not allow, this is what happens too often. And this is why, let me tell you why Christianity is being pushed in the back corner, okay? You can write this one down. The reason that this country, is, you know, if it's not already become dominantly now a Muslim country versus a Christian Protestant country, and how we're being overtaken and pushed in the corner, and it's just the way we are because we think that Jesus Christ was weak and lowly, but the Bible says he was meek and lowly. There was nothing weak about the Son of God. But here's the thing. We allow our surroundings and the world to change us. Instead of us taking God and his word and changing our surroundings and the world. Because there's some of you who come in here tonight with a chip on your shoulder because what happened to you today? When in fact you were supposed to be the one today called by his name, the only name under heaven that can save you and has saved you and has given you that and has already told you, hey, check this out. You're more than a conqueror with me. Yeah. And yet we lay down and we allow all these things to influence us. Let me tell you something about your light and your salt. See, if you allow the world to influence you, then the world changing your savior. And if you get the savor, and if you know if your salt has no savor, then it's no good. It should be cast out into the walkway and trodden under the feet of man. That's what's happening in God's church with God's people. And when we come together, we ought to be able to come in here and say, Oh, we stood the feet in the house of God. I love my brother. I love my sister. We are a family. United we stand. Divided we fall. God put a light that's bright in us. God give us our flavor back. And stop being changed by the world. And let us change the world. Thank you, Lord. That's what we're called to do. But the majority of us, depressed, Lip poked out, head hanging low, half dead, whatever. And it makes me mad. Because I say, you're never, ever, even if you live as long as, what was his name, 969, it don't make no difference if you live to be 1269. Amen. You're never going to change unless you get it and get it now. 
Let him change you. And I still change him. But here's what happens, right? There's going to be people maybe this Sunday, and it happens more than you know because this is not a thought process for you. But may God enlighten us tonight and may it change. This is what happens. And I've just recently been enlightened by this because of a lady who sat in a hospice house, and I sat in the room, and she told, she told me, it reminded me, Preacher Mac, you're not thinking like this either. But there will be some people, maybe this Sunday morning coming, who's going to walk through that door. And let me tell you what they're going to do. They're going to be uneasy because they're in God's house, number one. It may very well be they're a little uneasy because they're not saved, because they're the minority, or they should be. But they're coming into God's house now, and they're very uneasy. Maybe the Spirit's been de dealing with them. Various circumstances could we speculate all night long, but they're going to come in here. This is so much fun to be on some people's minds. Hear me now, because this happens. They're going to walk in there, and they're going to say, okay, this morning I'll rise up, and I'll put on my best, and today I will go to God's house. I may even try this letter in church because I've heard a lot about it. But God, I'm just telling you right now, this is the last time that I'm going to walk in a, in a church because I'm sick and tired of hearing churches where the preachers are coming out of the closet and committing adultery and seeing them in the liquor store and all the hypocrisy that bleeds all over the church. And all I ever hear is Christian people fight and fuss, and they got a point. It was settled long ago. When they say bury the hatchet, that means don't draw a map and don't carry your shot. But this is what happens. They'll walk in, they'll sit down right beside you this Sunday, and guess what's going to happen? Unless they see the fellowship, the synergy and the energy of believers may never change your life. Amen. I told you this before, and I'll tell you this, I believe this with all my heart, and I believe this of the Lord, but we'll never know truthfully until we get to heaven. The world is not going to send the majority of people to heaven. Churches Amen. will be responsible sending and filling up the very pit of hell more than any other cause in the world. You say, preacher, I disagree. Let's sit down and have a cup of coffee. They have no credibility about eternity. We do. I told you before, somebody walks in here tonight, runs in here and hollers off and just says, y'all a bunch of sorry people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we guess what I'm at. Uh, we get over the point you stand up among us and you make that very statement. Amen. It cuts us to the core and it disrupts what God's doing in this church Amen. because they've got credibility. Amen. Churches are sinning. How many churches this Sunday, they don't care, they don't care. As long as they've got their parking spot and their little seat by their little window and their little whatever, God help them. They don't care. And people will walk through and they will not warm. They will not show the love of God. Because I'm going to tell you why. The love of God ain't in them. A bunch of dead, dried up churches who can't even spell fellowship. Or they know it starts with a Z. But when they come in here, what's been, what's been doing in the church? Because she, you didn't do it. You didn't do it. You know why most people come here? It's not because of the preaching. Get a new witness. You better be glad you did it. Amen. <laughs> Got you. You know what's doing? You love each other. Right. Can you not see the love of God? <laughs> Can you not see a church that's alive? <clears throat> because he leads. Right. We leave. And we fellowship. And when they come in here, they see a place buzzing a little bit. Because leaven has got it going on because we got God. And that's all we need. And so we continue to do that. So when people come, they stick. Well, I'm going to try three other churches on my little, what they call it, record board. And what happens is they come in here and then, boom, they're done right here. I'm like, oh, it's no worry. Because they see the love of God. Now, the people who get in here, they membership, they, they leave. 
<laughs> you know what I'm saying. But I don't know. But maybe they're going to heaven. Praise the Lord. But here's the thing. Continue in your fellowship. Continue in the doctrine. Continue in your fellowship. Continue in breaking the bread. Continue in those things. But not only did they do it commonly and compassionately, they done it Christ like. That's the last point. I had to get that one out. Because if you begin to read the rest of your verses 46 and 47, and you see how they acted. They come in one accord. They love, you know what they love the most about the persecution? They knew it couldn't stop them. They would not take away their joy. So this is here, here is my challenge for you tonight. Okay? Hopefully in a couple of weeks, Lord Ben, we're gonna have concrete for them and anchor bolts standing up. Maybe by the fall fest, we're gonna have this infrastructure of the structure of the building. It won't be dried in, but people are gonna be able to see something from the highway that wasn't weeds. Amen? Amen. And that's gonna get exciting. <coughs> you know what? I believe that we get to see what God can do. Now we got a lot of people doubting us and you know, doubt me and doubt you, and I don't like that. I just love that motivates me. Tell us it can't be done. Then, uh, thank you, sir. But I like that. That's very good. God knows what I need, and he gives it to me, and he uses people to do it. So pile it up. But this is what happens. This same man just in a few years. Because let me tell you something. You remember how the old sanctuary filled up? 85% full, you're full. Remember what we had to do? Praise the Lord. Nobody stop it. Everybody in the church, grab a pew and come over here. You remember that? Oh, glorious day. It says a lot about the integrity and the character of this church. <laughs> then you know what happened? Then we got here, we put a wall up, we said recreation on this side, worship on this side. Guess what happened this side? It got full because if it gets 85% full, it's full. Amen. Now guess what happened? We knocked the wall down, the wall of Jericho. Nobody could even sell a plywood. If God said if you believe the rubble of Jericho, you'd be cursed. Nobody wanted plywood for the wall of Jericho. <laughs> So guess what happens? Now there's 400 blue chairs in this church. Not mentioning who is in children's church. I don't know if you noticed lately, but this church is, if not 85% full, it's not more than that. Now you've got to factor in the summer blues because people are going to be gone. You've got to factor in the winter blues because some people ain't going to come out tonight because it's too cold. That's the way it is. But this church is full again. <coughs> guess what? We will not grow beyond this point because we do not have the room. You know what I believe? Very confidently, I say, if we had a building right now, we had a thousand capacity, we'd build it up here. Amen. There's no doubt in my mind. You say, Preacher, what would they do with it? I don't know. Ask Peter what he did with the 3,000 they got that day. <laughs> Just go to house to house, break bread, pray, love one another unconditionally. God sends them, he knows what he's doing. Now the church has grown. I'm a non intervention program because God sent them. God continues to win souls. Bless them. I know some of you say, well, I don't want to get real big. You know, God's building it. I ain't getting in his way. Some of you say, let's let it be 500. All right, what you going to tell the rest of them when they die and go to hell because you didn't love them in your church? Prepare your statement on judgment day. But there's a lot of people who've been saved in this church right now because we said yes to God and know ourselves. But we need to continue. But here's what I want you to do. Even if we get done here, even in five years we move to 52 out there, what we call 52 fever, or a 64 acre track, where we can get on a pretty good piece of road there, where the people's not losing their sermon message before they get out of here, hollering their kids, saying, sit down, this person's going to run drive. <laughs> No, you're done. <laughs> Praise God, we've not had a wreck out here the way this stretch road. The people on Bayonne Ditch are running out of 67 mile an hour running up down the road on the church. They should have been in the church. They never left. <laughs> but here's what happens. Say we leave and move from here. We go out to 52 in a few years. And we have now a 64 acre track. And, and God bless them. He's doing that. There's a lot of logistics here. That's fine. I just tell God, it's your church. This is what I want you to do. And this is something we've not done a lot of. 
during this process, and this is what I want to describe on the night. We're going to close in prayer, and we're going home. Number one is I want you to enjoy the journey. Enjoy the journey. You know what I want more than anything right now? I don't want materialism. I'd love to have me a 1966 Chevelle Super Sport. I don't want no dollar money. I want a Super Sport. Amen, brother. <laughs> but you know what I learned? I believe if I ever get that 1966 Chevelle Super Sport, I'll quit more on it. You understand my point? The point is this. When we get to where God wants us to be, oh, we're going to be happy. We're going to be thanking God and praising God till Jesus comes. But let us not have all this bit of work and not enjoy the journey. I love the journey of figuring out how we're going to put people where and do a chair and figure it. I, I count it a privilege and a joy. Church, no matter what, let us enjoy it journey. And along the journey, here's number two, my final point. Enjoy one another. We've already had several who have died and gone on before us. You know what Brother James Badger, what his request is before he died? He said, I'd love to see that building built. But he never got to see it. Had some of us waited to got the building built and got to that place or that place of progress that God wanted us to be, and we'll get there. And if we're not careful, we'll be missed and not enjoy the journey and enjoy Brother James Patrick while we have We got to enjoy one another. You know, there's some of us who may not ever see the building completely erected. May it be said of us, we enjoy the journey and we enjoy one another. Some of you will never ever see that church on 52 and that 64 acre track. But it won't mean we didn't get there by ourselves. We got there because of you. Because God knew what he could do when he was building this church. Enjoy the journey. Enjoy one another. Fellowship. It'll keep us from <coughs> all others. Because they're looking for something real in this world that's not. And they're looking for love in that way he's had. So this Sunday, when one walks down the aisle and says, Okay, God, I've done tried this three times and I've been burnt. I've heard people stand up, throw hymn books, cuss and fuss. Fight with churches. This is the last time, God. This is my last opportunity. I'm giving you, God. And the world's full of people just like that. When they walk in here, no matter what time it is, whether it's on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Sunday school, Wednesday night, any meeting we ever have, a business meeting even. May it be said of us as God's body here at Lebanon Free Will Baptist Church that that person can find a secure home and serve God in the local church and become the person God designed them. Because we showed them the way. God help us do that. Let me tell you why I know God's just going to, just, things are just going to explode at the seams. You know why I know that? Number one, he told me. Number two, let me tell you why. Because there ain't many churches wanting to do this. And God is a God who has more love and more blessings. That he's wanting to pour out on people and he doesn't have an avenue to do it. If we can be one of the few to give God an avenue to do those things, there's no telling what will happen. Amen. Only heaven knows. But I'm going to enjoy the journey and I'm going to enjoy you. As long as we got one another. Can we stand here? Heads bow, eyes closed. Should be in God's house tonight. With God's people. I love you and I thank you for who you are and for what you're going to become.